In this installment of practical acoustics, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what we do with the output of all these propagation models that we've been working on in the lectures. And in general, um, you know, we've been looking at things like transmission loss, very intuitive way of looking at how much the sound has decayed over its propagation distance. Um, now, in almost all of our cases, and I think in almost all propagation models, we're almost always solving the Helmholtz equation, except for maybe things like uh, finite time difference, finite element models. But you know, for the um, integral solutions, for the Ray model, um, for the normal mode model, and for the parabolic equation model, we're, we're really solving p in terms of omega. And that's a complex value, it has some amplitude, has some phase, um, and so that gives us, you know, a little bit of information, and we always throw that out by computing transmission loss, um, which is, you know, the pressure times its complex conjugate, so that so the phase information uh, goes away, and then we normalize it even more. Right? We normalize it, um, so now we're looking at, you know, something that's really just a number between zero and one. Um, we take 20 log 10 of that, and that gives us our transmission loss at a single frequency. So yeah, here's an example down here in the bottom, uh, the bottom left of pressure um, used to drive transmission loss as a function of depth and range. And sometimes we simplify things even further, right, by just taking uh, one particular depth and plotting, you know, plotting some sort of transmission loss curve. Um, very rarely, but somewhat occasionally, we might look at the uh, transmission loss as a function of depth at a fixed range, right, to give an idea of how an array might work. So these are the results that we're used to um, used to deriving. Oops. What do we do with those results? What else can we do with those results? Well, you know. What we're trying to model here is what you would get if you just had a single sensor, right, at one of these pixels. Every pixel basically represents a hydrophone that you could put in the ocean. And that hydrophone would be recording a time series, you typically, you know, right? It's recording pressure as a function of time. And we talked about this in some of the other practical um, acoustics uh, videos. We're taking the Fourier transform of that to get this complex number, which is the amplitude and phase of the field at that point, right? So to relate that to a hydrophone, we have to do the same thing, right? We'd have to take the time series, take the Fourier transform, and get what would normally be, I guess that's the, the Fourier transform, uh, the, that would be the amplitude spectrum. We can calculate the, the power spectrum from there. Um, but let's just talk about that amplitude spectrum, this complex, this is a complex number, right? Um, and we can do things pretty, you know, we do some interesting things like this if we want to consider now array processing, coherent processing. So I've sort of sketched on here what happens when we put, you know, a whole bunch of hydrophones in our field uh, to represent an array. And now we have, you know, uh, hydrophone 1 through n, and we take the Fourier transform of all of those. Um, we can actually equate that perfectly to our model where we have now at each, you know, each one of these chosen pixels we have capital X I uh, of Omega, right? Now, if we want to simulate what we would do with a with an array, we can, you know, simulate some coherent processing using our model. So now let's say um, this value, capital Omega one, um, uh, sorry, capital X one Omega is from our model. Um, we can say, well, let, what, you know, what does the, what does the output of an array of a whole bunch of these Omegas uh, sorry, a whole bunch of these x omegas look like uh, if we do some coherent processing. So we can say, okay, well, what we do is we're going to sum over them um, with some array shading. This could be, you know, beam forming or you know, standard time time delay beam forming or some sort of any type of array shading, right? So this could be another complex s omega could be a, a complex number that you know provides some sort of signal processing to your simulated signal. And then from that, you can calculate, you know, very useful parameter array gain, um, where, 
you take the output of your coherent processing, same thing, you're taking its time the con complex conjugate. So we're, you know, reducing that complex information now just to a normalized, um, well, a, a dimensionless number here, because we're dividing by um, the square of a reference pressure, right? Now, a little bit tricky here, um, exactly what is that reference pressure? Well, I, I, that's something I haven't really found a, a standard definition of. Uh, some people might say that that's it's you know the reference pressure from a single hydrophone, and for a vertical array that could be the top hydrophone, it could be the middle hydrophone. Who knows? Um, some people take the mean across the array and say that's that's going to be the the reference. Um, um, or you could also say reference it to a pressure um, at a fixed range and a fixed depth, for instance. So yeah, you can do you know you can treat these outputs of your model the same way you would treat Fourier transformed um, variables determined from time pressure series data. Another nice thing you can do about these models is use the concept of reciprocity here, and I've made a quick sketch you know using a different transmission loss. Again, we have another transmission loss as a function of depth and range, and basically the idea is that if you place you know in in our simulation we've placed our source at A and computed the field everywhere. Um, and if you take the field at B and say, well, what would happen if we had the same environment, we took the source and put it at B, well, we can say determin you know, deterministically that the um, receiver, a receiver at A would have the same result as putting the source at A and the receiver at B, okay? So here, it's all explained in these two little arrow, arrow equations. Um, and this is very powerful and can be exploited for multiple sources. So now if you... Um, you know, you have a receiver at A, and you want to know what what's its ability to, you know, what the what is the field going to look like if there's little ships at C and D? Well, you can compute the field once, and then take the transmission loss or the complex pressure um, at C and the complex pressure at D, and coherently add them together, and that will give you um, the receive level at A from sources at C and D. Right? Very very powerful thing, and we'll see when we look at noise a little bit how amazing and how powerful that can really be. The last little thing in this short little video that I want to talk about is this little rub. So we had been always solving the Helmholtz equation, but what about when we want to understand uh, and we want to simulate things in time, right? So we had started with the wave equation. We used a Fourier transform to get the Helmholtz equation. We do a computational model, and we get some result in terms of frequency. Well, we can go back. We can simply just go back via the inverse Fourier transform to get that function in time. And you know, the diagram that I've given here is, you know, this is our output model um, from our computational model, and here's what we desire: some sort of pulse. That's, you know, we want to see. Well, if I put a delta function into the ocean, or if I put a a pulse from my sonar um, transducer into the ocean, what's it going to look like when it travels some distance and and gets received? And so I've written just this this Fourier this inverse Fourier transform out here and and drawn the arrow here to show that okay this is what we're computing in the computational domain and this is what we'd like to get. So of course we need to do this in a discrete way. And like I said a few slides ago, this p of r omega is for an infinitesimally small bandwidth. We do it at 50 hertz. We do it at 51 hertz. We do it at 100 hertz, for example, right? And so what we want to do is give, uh, is give it some real bandwidth now. And to do that, we're going to say choose, choose the limits of our, of our band that we're interested in computing over. And those could be determined by the limits of uh, the signal that we're actually looking at, or it could be determined by some resolution limits. And then you need to choose some sort of spacing, some frequency spacing. So um, you know, for example, if we're going to be looking at a signal between 50 and 100 hertz, do we want to compute it every 1 hertz or 0.1 hertz or every 10 hertz? Um, so then you get, you know, uh, a whole bunch of estimates of PR omega. And by summing over those, you can compute, um, some, sorry, by summing over those in this sort of discrete version of the Fourier, inverse Fourier transform, you can compute PR of t. Now, the interesting thing here is that I've put in quotes here, the length of this in the frequency domain determines how long your time domain record is. So if you make 
uh, if you make, you know, if you compute this over many, many points, right? Just in the same, uh, your, your inverse for your transform is gonna have many, many points, right? And so that those points are going to be um, related to how long the signal is in the time domain. The other, uh, the other crucial fact here is that um, the, the size of delta F that you choose, right? So this product of the size of delta F and the bandwidth itself, these FBs, um, what that determines is exactly um, the T, you know, how, how large of a window in T that you're going to be able to resolve, so the length of the signal in time, but also the time resolution and how, you know, um, how fine of these wiggles you're going to be able to resolve as well in, in the time series. So very hand wavy way of approaching that, a very non-mathematical way, but I think intuitive as well. And I hope that sort of gives some context to some of these simulations that we are doing and how they can be useful to, um, you know, compare against data. All right, thanks a lot.